Now we're going to talk about essay number two, which caught my eye. Confessions yes, of a Recovering Misogynist. That's a heavy one. Right. Could you go through and explain the definition of misogynist for those of you Ooh. who don't have your dictionary at hand? We got to spell it too? No. <laughs> well, misogyny, you know, basically means the hatred of women, period. Right. And so one of the things that I believe in as a writer is to be completely honest. You know, I was raised up in uh, uh, the Pentecostal branch of the Christian church. And I, my too. mama would say things like the truth will set you free. Right. And then as, a, as, a, as an adult, I f fell in love with great writers like James Baldwin, the great essayist. Uh, uh, Dr. Bell Hooks was one mm -hmm. of my big influences as a, as a thinker and a writer. And the thing I loved about them, you know, I love about Bell, since she's still alive, Baldwin died in 1987, as you know, is that their, their brutal honesty. And then one of my greatest uh, heroes is Malcolm X, who was always brutally honest, you know. Right. And so for me, I said, if I'm going to write a book called Who's Going to Take the Weight, Manhood, uh, Race and Power in America, with an emphasis on manhood for a second, I've got to be really honest about how I was socialized to be a male in this society. And just as this country was founded on uh, racism, we know that um, uh, African Americans and Native Americans were left out of the equation when the founding fathers were putting together this country. Right. We know that this country was also founded on sexism. Women, regardless of their racial background, white, black, whatever, were also left out. And so they didn't say founding fathers and mothers, they said founding fathers. Right. And so sexism has permeated this country from the very beginning as well. Well, even when I think about my education growing up, just how I didn't learn about African Americans or, or Latinos or Asians or Native Americans in the school system, I didn't learn about women. What did we learn? Betsy Ross sold a flag. You know, we might have heard about uh, Harry Tubman having the Underground Railroad, but right. no one bothered to explain what it was and the significance of it. You know, you might have heard about Helen Keller vaguely or Susan B. Anthony, and that was the extent of our, our, our history lessons about women and their contributions to the society. So like a lot of young boys growing up and a lot of men in our society, if you don't have a knowledge and appreciation for women, you're not going to respect women. And in some cases, you might go to the, uh, to the extreme of having a hatred of women. Right. And so I wanted to write a very personal essay uh, called Confessions of a Recovering Misogynist that talked about all the foul and despicable stuff and it's not easy to write that it wasn't easy to write that essay because you're really naked but again just like with the first essay I wanted to write something you know Toni Morrison said it you know we should write the books that we want to see and right. so for me in this generation as a product of the hip hop generation I wanted to see a book from a male perspective that really talked about how we've been socialized and also challenged those, that socialization right you talked a lot in, in the essay about domination and, and violence yes ma'am what are some examples of your childhood that brought you to being a misogynist wow i came from a violent uh household you know what i'm saying because you know and i know we're in the south but uh my mother and my family members you know um felt that the way they have been socialized which was is if a child is bad just beat them you know what right, i'm saying right. and what we don't realize is that you're oftentimes teaching a child that the way to deal with any conflict is violence you know especially when we you know how we say in the church spare the rod spoil a child <laughs> it didn't say kill the child it didn't say you know beat the hell out of the child you know what i'm saying right. and you know we can laugh about it now but i i was i i've been in therapy for a long time as a result of that language of violence becoming my language and i'm not blaming my mother or my other family members but the reality is is that until we break that vicious cycle that malcolm x talked about you know just how my mother was brutalized when she was raised up or my other uh, families were brutalized i grew up and i started to brutalize people and I mean it starts as a child where you're running around and and doing things like grabbing girls breasts or their behinds in school right. it starts with you just fighting after school every single day you get to college and you find yourself throwing stuff at people a stapler or I mean the crazy stuff that I did I think about now mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying you, you you realize man this is not the way to live your life um. You stated earlier that your mother was your foundation and yes, she she's the basis of your life and she was a single mom. Yes, How did that have an effect on you being a misogynist? Well, um, it, it's, it's, that's an interesting question because on the one hand, my mother is my foundation, as you said, and I would not be here. I would not be sitting here if it wasn't for my mother. I mean, if people read my, my work, my, be it my essay book or my poetry or hear me speak, I constantly reference my mother. But by the same token, when I think about it, and this is not a diss of my mother, but she raised me basically how she was socialized, which is, you know, a lot of times in our communities, uh, uh, girls are, are, are developed holistically, you know what I mean, to be right. very independent, whereas boys are raised to be very dependent, you know, I wasn't taught how to cook, I wasn't how to, taught how to uh, sew or cook or clean, a lot of stuff that I took for granted, and I don't think it's everyone in our community, but I've noticed that a lot of us have, you know, like one of the first questions a lot of men will ask women, you know, is, is how, do you know how to cook? cook right. And the question <laughs> should be, well, I know how to cook, you know, and I can handle my business as well, and so that's part of it, you know, and I I think also 
what happened with my mother being a single parent and me being a son, being a boy, in a lot of ways, you know, uh, uh, and I don't think we should blame black women for this because I get mad when people say uh, that, that black women are the reason why black men are the way they are. That's, that's I, I, it's erroneous. What I think happens on a psychological level is that you begin to see your son as a replacement for that father, that male figure, that man mm -hmm. that was in your life. And so I think that kind of happened as well. And so, but that's the context of this black woman raised me by herself, you know? Right. And it could be any woman, not just a black woman, obviously. And so that was part of it. And I think my mother raised me as best she knew how based on the, the social mores that she had been given. And I don't want to say she's the reason why I became a misogynist because it's a whole community we're talking right. about. You know, you're talking about the, the curriculum of the school system, as I talked about. It's the films and, and TV shows that I got. It's what goes on on the block with other people's families. You know, all of that stuff contributed. And so if anything, and I think to you know, give my mother credit, is that she used to say to me when I was a little boy all the time, don't be like your father. Don't be like your father. He's no good. Don't be like that. And so even though she couldn't quite tell me what to be, it was stuck in my mind very early on that to be a man is not to be this kind of irresponsible human being. Right. I hate to cut you off, Kevin, but we got to go to another commercial break. Okay. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here again with Kevin Powell, writer of Who's Going to Take the Weight, Manhood, Race, Race and Power thank you. in thank America. You. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Now, you spoke earlier about becoming intimate with yourself to actually admit that you were a misogynist. What process and what, what did you go through to actually come, become intimate with yourself? Wow. I think uh, you ask great questions. Thank you. I keep saying that, but you do. Um, you know, the, the, the straw was um, July 1991 when I got into an argument with a girlfriend I was living with at the time and I pushed mm -hmm. her into a bathroom door, which is something that I regret deeply and you know many years later I was able to finally apologize to, to her for it because she actually talked to me again you know right. and um, I just sunk very low you know but the thing was that uh, again I heard my mother's voice in the back of my head don't be like your father right. don't be like your father and luckily I had some women in my life at that time actually women who went to Spelman College you know um, Spelman? Spelman College and um they, you know, introduced me to some things I needed to read. I was introduced to an author named Pearl Klieg who wrote a book called Mad at Miles, a little tiny book about her, it was her response to Miles Davis's uh, autobiography where he bragged about beating up Cicely Tyson, the actress, you right. know. They introduced me to people like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and, and uh, a whole range of women writers. And I realized, I began to realize for the first time that those four years I was at Rutgers University when I was in college, I think I only read, read one female writer of any note. That was Zora Neale Hurston's oh, Their Eyes Were Watching God oh, and that's so required yeah text. <laughs> it's required text right. absolutely and so I didn't really really read any books about about gender and gender oppression you know what I mean about sexism about patriarchy about misogyny and so my mind as I was developing college around race and racial issues I wasn't dealing with this part of me and right. so that was the first thing and the second thing was definitely again I can't stress it enough going back going to counseling and being willing to look yourself in the mirror and say well who am I you know why am I doing the things that I do where did this all come from and, and, and even though it was very, very difficult being willing to look women in the eyes and not just talk, but we as men have to learn how to listen to women. Right. And so those things were the things that began to uh, turn the corner for me. Now, of course, we know that a lot of your relationships were probably affected by this um, thought of misogyny. What advice would you give to women who mm. also go through this with male figures, especially in college, because it's dominating right absolutely, now? Absolutely. I say to women, uh, and I say it everywhere I go, and, um, you know, do not deal with any man who does not respect you as a human being, as an equal, you know, right. who respects your intellect, who only, who don't, don't deal with any man who only looks at you from the neck down, you know, it's just about your body. Make sure they respect you here, you okay. know, and it's important for women to respect and love yourselves, you know what I'm saying? It's so important because we live in a society 
society that basically teaches women just, you know, just how men are sexist. Women internalize the sexism. So a lot of you all believe that if you're not physically looking a certain kind of way, you right. know, then you're not appealing. And I say, no, you know, you got to respect your spirit and your mind. That's so important. Don't be with any man who doesn't respect you spiritually, and intellectually. What are some of the things that you're doing now? Because I, I know it's, it's probably a lifetime ongoing experience. Absolutely. It's probably a, 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 the recovery is probably still you know coming or going on what are some of the things that you're doing to recover from this well again um one i continue to go to counseling because that's important number two i'm proud to say that i've been in some very uh, uh progressive relationships since that ugly incident in july 1991 and so each relationship i've been in with the woman has been better than the last one you know because right. i believe in in being honest now about what 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 i feel what hurts me etc and not seeing uh, uh arguing and violence as the way to be in relationships because i think a lot of times we are socialized that conflicts are the way to live your lives and right. so i disagree with that uh changing the language that i use you know i think it's very problematic for men to use the b word the h word all those different words very loosely if at all you know right. i refuse to use those terms and i certainly don't think you know at you know we should should uh, uh think that our language does not affect our mindset if you will so that's important to me uh number three speaking out about sexism everywhere i go you know what i mean making sure because i think that a lot of men will are quicker to listen to a man than they will to a woman so i feel like i have an obligation because i now know some things i didn't know before right. to write about it you know be it uh in my book in SS Magazine and Ms. Magazine as I've done in the past to speak about it everywhere I go and to challenge men everywhere I go to rethink how we define manhood in this country. And so right. what has happened in hip hop, you know, over the last 10 to 12 years to me, has been this incredible commodification and, and over uh, exploitation of, of, of the, the sexism that's always been there. And so you don't get songs like the Jungle Brothers song from the late 1980s, Black Woman Anymore. Right. You know, you don't get those kind of, uh, you know, don't get LL Cool J's I Need Love Anymore. Everything is very hard, you know what I mean? Right. It's like, it's not about your woman anymore, it's about your wifey, you know what I'm saying? Right. Or if you do have a girl and your name is fabulous you got a, someone else who's the pinch hitter sitting on the right. bench you know so it's very disrespectful to women and I think that the industry you know the five record labels that control most of the music on the planet these 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 record these radio stations that play the same 12 13 songs over and over again mm -hmm. and even some of our video outlets that show these images of women only in a certain kind of way I mean I saw a magazine just come out in Brooklyn New York where I live which is a really good magazine when you look inside it's about Brooklyn and all kinds of things happening culturally mm -hmm. politically on the cover is a woman who's half naked Oh, goodness. You know, because they said it's, it's a way to get people to buy the magazine, right. you know. Or I was just looking at my boy Ed Garns. When we were in his car, I'm looking at Kalis' new album, you know. I mean, I love the song Milkshake. I'm not a square or anything like that. But I'm looking at the uh, the pictures of her. She's sitting on top of a milkshake. You know, it's very sexual. You see her on the inside. It's like a, a pinup poster, basically. It's like everything is about sex and nudity. It's become like soft porn. And because hip-hop has been so male-dominated from the very beginning, when it was started in the late 60s, early 70s, it's right. almost as if now... You know, um, some of us, to me, are manifesting.